Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. May I request everyone to please keep your phones on silent? And I would take this opportunity on behalf of the foundation to wish everyone a happy new year. May I also request the dignitaries to come up on the dais to light the lamp. May I request Anisha and Krishna to come up to give the... Just Anisha then. <laughs> to come up to give the plants. May I now request Justice Lokur to give the welcome address. Uh, 
thank you, Shreya. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 28th Justice Sunanda Bhandare Memorial Lecture. Today we have as our distinguished speaker the Honorable Justice B.V. Nagaratna, Judge of the Supreme Court. The guest of honor is Mr. Fali S. Nariman, an eminent jurist, and the occasion is presided over by Honorable Justice Manmohan, Acting Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. Before introducing the distinguished personalities on the days, I would like to say a few words about the Justice Sunanda Bhandare Foundation and present a few of its activities over the last year. Sunanda Bhandare graduated in law and enrolled with the Maharashtra Bar Council in 1968 after she had two children. In 1970, she began her practice in the Supreme Court and was appointed a judge of the Delhi High Court in 1984 at the young age of 42. As a lawyer and as a judge, she distinguished herself with her mastery of law, her professionalism, and a concern for the rights of women and the underprivileged in her life. She, allowed, she followed the credo, freedom to choose, right to excel, which is now a motto of the Justice Sunanda Bhandare Foundation. She passed away, unfortunately, in November 1994 at the age of 52. The foundation was established in 1995 to perpetuate her memory. Through various activities over the past 27 years, the foundation has sought to promote human rights, gender justice, and empowerment of women and differently abled persons. The foundation has grown primarily through the support of its volunteers and well-wishers. <coughs> From an initial annual memorial lecture, the activities now encompass a wide range of interests. I would only like to mention that in 2012, the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences in Kolkata honored Justice Bhandare by establishing a Justice Sunanda Bhandare Forum for Natural Resources Law to facilitate research and publication and organize training programs. Some of the activities of the foundation over the last year included the 29th Memorial Lecture delivered on 4th November 2022 at this venue by Professor Abhijit Banerjee, Nobel Laureate. The topic of the lecture by the distinguished speaker was democracy on the ground, what works, what doesn't, and why. As one would expect, the lecture was delivered to a full house and was not only informative, but also instructive. On that occasion, the chief guest was the Honorable Justice Hima Kohli, Judge of the Supreme Court, and the lecture was presided over by Honorable Justice Siddharth Mridul, Judge of the Delhi High Court, presently the Chief Justice of Manipur High Court. A one-day seminar was held on International Women's Day which falls on 8th March. The theme of the seminar was women empowerment. The audience primarily consisted of law students having been organized uh, in the auditorium of St. Thomas College of Law in Greater Noida. The distinguished speakers included Sri M.C. Bhandare, former governor of uh, Odisha, and uh, Professor Dr. Irshad Muhammad Khan, Dean of Chaudhary Charan Singh University in Meerut, as well as Ms. Jesse Kurian, an eminent lawyer in the Supreme Court, and Dr. Nituja Singh, Assistant Professor at Shahda University. The Foundation organized yet another seminar on 29th April 2023, again at this venue, on the topic Ending Domestic Violence. The seminar was extremely well received and was also quite topical, considering the fact that there has been an increase in reported cases of domestic violence from 2020 onward. The chief guest on the occasion was Honorable Justice Mukta Gupta, judge of the Delhi High Court, and the panelists were all eminent lawyers practicing in the Supreme Court, that is Ms. Pinky Anand, Ms. Minakshi Arora, and Mr. Prasanjit Banerjee. A YouTube link of the program is available, and I would urge those 
who wish to know more about the cause, about the causes for an increase in domestic violence and the legal remedies available for the victims to watch the YouTube program. The Foundation conducts legal awareness camps and legal literacy camps every year, and the year gone by was no exception. A legal awareness camp was organized by Tista Bhandare for artists at Anant Art Gallery and an informative session by lawyers who are experts on aspects of law pertaining to creative practitioners. The year ended with the sad demise of Dr. V. Mohini Giri, a trustee of the foundation on 19th December 2023. She had been a guiding spirit with a deep commitment to women's issues. She had been a source of inspiration to members of the foundation and its volunteers who work for the empowerment of women and the underprivileged classes of society. Her sad demise is an irreparable loss to the foundation and to volunteers. On behalf of the chairperson, trustees, volunteers, and well-wishers of the foundation, I express our deep condolences on her sad demise. May her soul rest in peace. The distinguished speaker today is Honorable Justice B.V. Nagaratna, a judge of our Supreme Court. She needs no introduction, but for the record, she graduated in law in 1987 from the Campus Law Center, Delhi University. Soon after, she practiced law in Bangalore and was elevated as judge of the High Court of Karnataka in 2008 and appointed as judge of our Supreme Court on 31st August 2021. She has been a champion of gender justice and child rights and a variety of social causes. She will be the first woman Chief Justice of India in 2027. She has chosen a very important and relevant topic for her lecture today, the role of the judiciary in empowerment of Indian women. Our guest of honor today is Mr. Fali S. Nariman, a distinguished jurist who also needs no introduction. He is a Padma Vibhushan and was nominated a member of the Rajya Sabha. He is the author of several eminently readable books and widely regarded and acknowledged as the doyen of the bar. In my view, he is not the conscience keeper, but the conscience of the bar. <laughs> Presiding over the lecture today is Honorable Justice Manmohan, presently acting Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court, but hopefully not for very long. He too is a graduate of Campus Law Center, Delhi University, and a contemporary of Honorable Justice Nagaratna. He has taken keen interest in a variety of activities and has addressed and participated in various seminars and conferences of national and international repute. With these words, I welcome everybody to the 28th Justice Sunanda Bhandare Memorial Lecture and request Mr. Nariman, our guest of honor, to say a few words. Thank you. Chief Justice Manmohan, very nice to see you again. And uh, friends and admirers of the Justice Sunanda Bandare Foundation, I am delighted to be here this evening for more than one reason. First of all, Sunanda's husband, Muldi, has been a very good friend of mine for over 70 years. <laughs> Ever since we first studied in the same college, the Government Law College, Bombay, which itself is a very age-old institution of legal learning, but like Johnny Walker, it's still going strong. 
even after a century and a half of its founding. But there is also another reason why I am here. It is to listen to the 2024 memorial lecture to be delivered by the daughter of a former Chief Justice of yesteryear, Justice E.S. Venkataramaya, before whom I had frequently appeared and whom I greatly admired. Did he know his law? You bet he did. And he also knew his case law. We counsel in the 1970s and 1980s were hard put to it to argue cases before this extraordinarily intelligent and hardworking judge. But all this, ladies and gentlemen, is about yesterday. What about today and tomorrow? Well, I must tell you that Justice Nagaratna, like her noble father, is also a hard taskmaster. <laughs> in the last few declining years of my own active practice in the Supreme Court, I myself witnessed her work and her demeanor on the bench. What I admire is not just her legal knowledge, like that of her father's, but in important constitutional cases, she has shown that she is able, ready, and willing to dissent from the views expressed by other colleagues on the bench. A few years ago, Justice Rowington Nariman wrote a book in two volumes about dissenting judges around the world and their judgments. If you haven't read it, ladies and gentlemen, do try and get to read it, especially the first chapter. It is titled, The Need for Dissent. Yes, I do believe it is needed. Because often, a dissent in a bench of judges, whether of three, five, seven, or nine, is not just a safety valve. It also sends a message of assurance to the ever curious and ever anxious general public that the highest court is in robust health and doing its allotted task well. On reading about the very exhaustive and learned judgments on Kashmir recently handed down by a constitution bench of five judges, my regret has been that there was no dissent. A dissent would have made no difference to the outcome. But better still, it would have helped the not so well informed general public to better understand and appreciate the contours of this unique, very long and somewhat complicated case about India's northernmost state. And it is always necessary to recall what an American judge once wisely said. A dissent may salvage for tomorrow a legal principle that has been omitted or forgotten today. Lastly, it is both significant as well as propitious that Justice Nagaratna has been handpicked by Mulidhar and his dear daughter Manali to deliver this year's memorial lecture. Significant because when Sunanda, bless her soul, was with us, she was always a live wire as a human being, but she was also a stormy petrol as a judge. Also propitious because my wife Babsi and I, and almost the entire bar in Delhi, had hoped, and we also predicted, that with her talents, she would in due course of time end up as India's first Lady Chief Justice but fate willed otherwise. But what a strange but fortunate twist of fate that Sunanda and Manali have chosen for the memorial lecture this year, a person who, if all goes according to plan, will actually become not only the 54th CJI, but will also be the first ever Chief Justice of India. <laughs> and so lastly, ladies and gentlemen, to the organizers of this lecture, I commend that well-known line of an 18th century poem, like Abu Ben Adam, 
May their tribe increase. Thank you. May I now request Justice B.V. Nagratna to deliver the 28th Memorial Justice Sunanda Bhandare Lecture on the role of the judiciary in empowerment of Indian women. Namaskar and a very good evening to everybody. My distinguished colleagues of the Supreme Court, Honorable Sri Justice Manmohan, Acting Chief Justice, Delhi High Court, who was my classmate at Campus Law Center between the years 1984 and 1987. We were in the same section and we sat at the same bench. And Justice Sikri used to teach us. Sri Fali Nariman, learned senior advocate, who besides being a sterling constitutionalist, has also been a forthright votary of gender justice. Sri M.C. Bandare, learned senior advocate and lifelong companion of Justice Sunanda Bandare, family of Justice Sunanda Bandare and Justice M.C. Bandare, Justice Madan B. Lokur, former judge, Supreme Court of India, and the chairman of the Sri Justice Sunanda Bandare Foundation, along with its office bearers, honorable judges who are present here, both sitting and retired, learned senior advocates and members of the bar, distinguished invitees, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, who are all present here and on digital platform. At the outset, I deem it a privilege to deliver the 28th Sunanda Bandare Memorial Lecture and make my humble contribution to the stream of social legal thinking that this memorial lecture series signifies. I thank the office bearers of the foundation and particularly Mr. Murlidhar Bandare and his family for this opportunity because I have always believed that a legal culture that would not remember its icons would recede into what Dr. Upendra Bakshi observes, a world of unjust amnesia a world without memory or history. Born on 1st November 1942, Justice Bandare was a trailblazer. Blazer. She was recommended for appointment as an additional judge at the young age of 42 years and a permanent judge in 1985. I fondly remember that late Justice Bandare and Sri Murlidhar Bandare visited our home, number four Tuglak Road and met my father and myself before her elevation as a judge of the Delhi High Court. I have known of the illustrious legacy of Justice Bhandare as a judge and as an advocate, who through her exemplary virtues of head and heart, demonstrated an unsurpassable combination of excellence and empathy. She was not only a compassionate and strong judge and a versatile lawyer, but also a remarkable daughter, a doting daughter-in-law, a loving wife, and a mother. She considered the law as an instrument of social progress and judiciary as an active facilitator of the progressive realization of human rights. It is said that even a monarch has to obey when fate summons. Even though she did not live for long, she had left behind a great legacy to be continued by her family and well-wishers. I think that but for her untimely demise, she would have perhaps become the first woman to grace the office of the Chief Justice of India. I endorse what Mr. Nariman has just said. While still an undergraduate in Bombay, Sunanda married Mr. Murlidhar. It was a love marriage, I think. And Mr. Murlidhar said that they waited for her to turn 18 before they could tie the knot. She graduated after her first child was born, Rahul. And later, when Manali came, she took up the law college examination and got first division in her exams. She was a young mother of two when she was enrolled on the rolls of the Maharashtra Bar Council. 
and she shattered the widely held belief that a woman succeeds at work only at the cost of her home. Maintaining a fine balance between professional and personal life, she went on to make exemplary contributions to the legal profession and jurisprudence. Speaking at the seminar, she said, and I quote, a woman's place in society marks the level of civilization. That is why I have chosen the subject today. Sunanda was a both vivacious and versatile personality. Her collection of art was only rivaled by her deep immersion in the world of music, especially classical music. I don't wish to burden this lecture by her role played in Bai Tahira versus Ali Hussain Fisali, where she was an advocate appearing and Justice Krishnaya ruled that a divorced Muslim woman was entitled to maintenance for, from her former husband. It is said that the true measure of a judge's character and personality is through her judgments. Before proceeding to deliver my lecture, I deem it fit to mention a few judgments of Justice Bhandare that have not only endured the test of time and circumstances, but contributed to the glowing constellation of judicial opinions that have preserved constitutionalism and the rule of law. One of the judgments is in the case of Harbhajan Singh Juara, which is a case of preventive detention, where she ruled that a representation made by the detinue must be considered with all promptitude and not delayed by seeking opinions from various departments. She said promptitude and diligence and sense of urgency is required in such matters. The second is with regard to ex-major N.R. Ajwani's case, which shows her testament in service law. She said that persons in the army, under, the, uh, under the Army Act who are also facing judicial proceedings are entitled to judicial review, being in regard to the punitive termination and that the doctrine of camouflage would, would be a safeguard against such punitive termination. This was held to be a facet of judicial review. Justice Bandare delivered this judgment just two days before she left for her last treatment to England. Her act of deliver, delivering this erudite judgment amidst extreme pain with a body ridden with disease is perhaps monument of all personal discomfort and sacrifices that judges endure to uphold the oath of office in full measure. It is a matter of relief that this judgment came to be affirmed one week after she passed away. With this humble tribute to Justice Sunanda Bandare, I would like to share a few of my thoughts on the topic, role of the judiciary in the empowerment of Indian freedom, Indian women, sorry. I have, uh, segregated this lecture into two parts, three parts, and I shall mention about them as I move forward. Before elaborating on the subject, it is essential to underline the aspirations of our founding ma mothers who are part of the Constituent Assembly. I begin by quoting from a speech made by a legendary freedom fighter and a member of the Constituent Assembly, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, in 1932 at Jalandhar. She said, and I quote, the women of India are no longer willing to submit to standards, whether local, political, or ethical, which have been set for them by the male conscience of the community. We are passionately aware that such standards are, have often been allowed to imply the complete subordination or even degradation of whole classes of women. We are aware of the necessity of finding and being judged by our own standards of free human beings voluntarily accepted. We are determined to face the facts of life, to fight the battles of our sex, and take the risks. These words in, of 1932 are so true even till today. As a student of history, I would always say that the anti-colonial struggle of India is not merely a quest for political independence, but a mission of social transformation and moral and spiritual recovery. Gender justice, as reflected in the concomitant struggles for abolition of sati, widow rebarriage, and women's education, 
was nothing short of the cornerstone of this moral mission. The freedom movement and our founders imagined a new Indian woman with a complete individuality and self-sufficiency. Yet we are here to see who that new Indian woman is. I would only touch upon a few articles of the Constitution, such as Articles 22, uh, 25 to B, 38, 14, 15, 1, 15, 2, 23, 39, A, D, E, and 42, and Article 16 and 46, which all go to ensure the empowerment of women under the Constitution. But the pertinent topic is the Indian judiciary's role in the empowerment of Indian women. I have said that I will speak on three aspects of it. The first is the judiciary has subjected the gender bias laws, policies, and norms to constitutional scrutiny. Thus, the courts, as guarantors of equal protection, have played a critical role in ensuring that non-discrimination and fairness emerge as a central governing principle of state policy in all spheres of public life. I shall elucidate. Second is that the judiciary has amplified special laws and policies enacted by, for women by accentuating the constitutional intent. It has assumed the role of affirmative action enabler by reading up statutes which protect and preserve women's rights and striking down those laws which discriminate against women. The third is that the judiciary has crafted creative remedies to redress systemic injustice and exploitation of women and taken up the role of initiator of societal reform and transformation. First is with regard to the guarantors of equal protection. To this audience, I need not speak much about the content and compass of Article 14, which goes beyond guaranteeing equality. It is also with regard to the equal protection of the laws. What is critical is that the state law or practice aggravates or perpetuates the subordinate position of a specially disadvantaged group. In such a case, the courts have always stepped in to see that discrimination is eliminated. I will only refer briefly to certain cases in this regard. In V. Tulsamma versus Sheshareti, the Supreme Court emphasized how the advent of independence necessitated a transition from the old human values and which assume a new complex now. The Supreme Court said that in the matter of succession of Hindu women, there could be no discrimination. The decision of the Supreme Court in C.B. Muttamma versus Union of India is highly instructive. The great Justice Krishnayar rendered a judgment, although the discrimination was removed even during the pendency of the case. He said, and I quote, if the family and domestic commitments of a woman member of the service is likely to come in the way of efficient discharge of duties, a similar situation may well arise in the case of a male member. But it doesn't really occur so to males, I suppose. It naturally follows that equal protection is quite distinct from protectionism. Protectionist laws and practices are those which seek to protect the women or their family or their community. But protectionist laws cannot be violating the equal protection of the laws. With regard to Section 66 of the Factories Act 1948, the Madras High Court in R. Vasanta said that women cannot be excluded from employment during night shifts when they are being employed in the same factory during the two day shifts and denial of employment on the sole ground of sex is violative of Article 15 and therefore discriminatory. The famous judgment of the Supreme Court in Anuj Garg versus Hotel Association of India, which was only with regard to a validity of Section 30 of the Punjab Excise Act, which prohibited any man under 20, age 25 and any woman from selling liquor was in fact a total discrimination as against women. A bemused apex court said, instead of prohibiting women employment in the bars altogether, the state should focus on factoring in ways through which unequal consequences of sex differences can be eliminated. 
I say that in the guise of protectionism, there is discrimination which the Supreme Court found out and said it was wrong. In Indian Hotels and Restaurants Association was state, was the state of Maharashtra. It was with regard to the prohibition of dance performances in eating houses, permit rooms, etc. The Supreme Court held that those provisions, that is sections 33A and 33B of the Bombay Police Act, were violative of Article 14, as there was no justification for treating women differently. Recently, the Supreme Court has scrutinized the administrative requirements rooted in stereotypes about women's ability and their physiological characteristics in Babita Punya and Lieutenant Colonel Nitisha while granting long, uh, gra long service commissions to the women. Justice Chandrachud, the present Chief Justice who wrote the judgment said, the true spirit of equality is not just superficial and symbolic, it must be substantive. I had a, an opportunity to write a judgment in Association of Old Settlers of Sikkim versus Union of India. I think Justice uh, uh, Vishwanathan appeared in that matter, where the point was that an individual in Sikkim was entitled to income tax exemption, but they forgot that an individual would include a woman they excluded a woman from the concept of individual. <laughs> and they said, if a Sikkimese woman married a non-Sikkimese, then the exemption would not apply. But if a Sikkimese male married a non-Sikkimese, he would be entitled to exemption. Therefore, there was discrimination on the basis of marriage. And I held that the benefit must be given because a Sikkimese individual would definitely include a Sikkimese woman. Now I come to the next part of the talk that is on affirmative action enabler. Another facet of judiciary's role in furthering the cause of gender equality is emphasizing the constitutional mandate of emancipation of women or from prevention of violence and exploitation against them. The bias and pernicious treatment of women commences from the womb till the tomb. However, the legislation, the parliament has come up with the Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act called PCPNDT Act. But how far that act is really implemented is a question. I feel that the judiciary is duty bound to strengthen the hands of other organs of the state to optimize the achievement of the haloed constitutional ob objective of equality of women, even at the stage of their birth. Affirmative action to enhance the representation of women in all spheres of public life is a bounden duty of all organs of the state. One of the ways in which this could be achieved is by having greater representation of women in our legislative bodies. In fact, India has the largest number of elected women representatives in the world. Judiciary has played a key role in reinforcing the principles of representation, representative governance. In this regard, I would like to highlight as to what was the position and what happened in Karnataka. In Karnataka, there is a very salutary provision which says that not less than 50% of the representatives in local bodies must be women. Very good. But what did they do? They added two provisos. The first proviso is that when it comes to the uh, adhyaksha and upadhyaksha of local bodies, Zilla Panchayat, Taluk Panchayat, or you may call them chairman or vice chairman, or president and vice president, they said, the proviso said that two women simultaneously could not hold the post of adhyaksha and upadhyaksha. I found that strange because if two men could, why not two women simultaneously? Then there was another proviso that one woman adhyaksha or upadhyaksha cannot succeed another um, adhyaksha or upadhyaksha. The, I found that also strange. Though those provisions were not challenged, the challenge was with regard to the reservation as such. I nevertheless struck down those provisos 
and said that they were against Article 14 and something where it says when 50% should be women, you give, again, you see, give it in one hand and take it by the other. I observed if the intention of the legislation is that 50% of the seats in Taluk Panchayat must be reserved for women candidates and 50% of the posts for chairpersons must also be reserved for women candidates, then the restrictions that two women cannot hold the post of chairpersons in a Taluk Panchayat simultaneously and two women cannot hold the post of chairperson consecutively irrespective of the category to which they belong are unreasonable restrictions and antithetical to the empowerment of women in a democracy and particularly in the context of local self-government. Next, property is one of the important endowments or natural assets to accord opportunity, right to equal status and dignity of a person, particularly in a household or a family. Therefore, the parliament enacted the amendments to the Hindu Succession Act in the year 2005. To this audience, I need not delineate on the Vinita Sharma case, where the Supreme Court held that Section 6 is retroactive and not prospective. Therefore, even if partition has taken place till the actual division of property by meets and bounds, on the basis of the amendment to Section 6, there could be a recalculation of the shares and for division of properties on an equal footing between the sons and the daughters. Of course, this provision has led to a lot of litigation, but I must tell that if the father, the brother, or the cousins, if they accept this provision, then automatically there would be no litigation. The daughter or the sister would not go to court. Therefore, it is there, the need is to implement this provision within the household and ensure that there is no litigation as such. At the same time, to balance, I may say this, where the daughters are very well off as compared to the brothers, then I think the daughters also must have a feeling and a heart for their brothers and not really insist on their pound of flesh. Another instance of this commitment towards women is the enactment of the Protection of Women for Domestic Violence Act or the DV Act. When this legislation was under debate, the women MPs especially said that there should be need for democracy in our households. I had the privilege of authoring a judgment in Prabhatyagi versus Kamlesh Devi, wherein Section 17 was interpreted as a separate right to say that a woman has a right of residence in a shared household, even in the absence of there being any domestic violence. I may say that when particularly young brides get married and they are not working women, the vulnerability, marriage is one thing good. It's, it is supposed to be a security for a woman who is not working, but the vulnerability is her right of residence in her matrimonial home must be protected. And secondly, she must have some financial a provision also made if she is not working. A woman cannot be expected to only save from the family budget for her own expenses. In Prabhatyagi, I said that the right to reside must not be conditional upon the existence of domestic violence. Given the social reality of dependence of women, especially young brides in their matrimonial family on shelter and finance, if they have no independent source of income. There is no gain seeing that fact that most enduring protection against economic exploitation within households is the financial independence of women. I often say that women can get into formal workforce but are often hindered from getting up in the profession, just as in the legal profession, due to lack of sharing of household duties and responsibilities and bringing up of children and in performance of domestic chores. In 2023, the Global Gender Gap Report pegged the gender gap score at 68.4%, and it said that it would take 131 years to equalize earnings between men and women 
at the current rate of progress. Though we have the Equal Remuneration Act 1976, it is very difficult to ensure that the women get the equal pay as that of the men. This was the problem which arose in McKinnon McKenzie versus Audrey de Costa, and where they said that the Equal Remuneration Act could not apply because the justification of that company was the pay disparity is against female stenographers because their work was within inverted commas, confidential, was not a valid reason for paying, and it was a valid reason because they were taken as confidential private secretaries, and therefore they need not be paid more as compared to the male stenographers. That was struck down. But unfortunately, the Supreme Court in the late 70s and early 80s in Nargis Mirza and Air India Cabin Crew Association versus Yashashwini Merchant tried to say that in the interest of family planning, a woman air hostess must not get married within the first four years of her marriage and uh, must not get children within the first three or four years of her marriage. And there were many other kind of restrictions which were actually upheld by the Supreme Court. In my humble view, those judgments would call for a course correction. On the other hand, when it comes to maternity benefits, the courts, courts have been very liberal in ensuring the a bargain is struck between the motherhood and employment. In this regard, I must say two things. Especially women in the unorganized sector or the private sector, once they join the uh, organization, then the question is, a question is asked in certain organization as to when was their last period because they want to know whether they are pregnant or not. In case they are pregnant, they know that they are bound to go because of maternity leave. In, that, in such a case, why should we appoint such a woman? The second thing is, if a woman asks in the private sector for maternity leave, then when she returns, her job is already taken by somebody else. So with, when she has a child, it means she loses her job. That cannot be the situation. In Inspector Mahila Ravina versus Union of India, the Delhi High Court said that a female inspector was entitled to her promotion and her participation in the pre-promotion course, which was delayed on account of pregnancy, could not be held against her. When I was in the Karnataka High Court, we had a case where a judicial officer was asked to take oath on a particular day because she had passed in the recruitment. And she came on that day and met the Registrar General of the High Court and said, Sir, any day I am due, I am already, I have to, uh, the delivery date is fast approaching. I do not know whether I can come and take the oath on that day. And uh, she was right because she couldn't come and take the oath on that day. She had already delivered the child. Then my male colleague said she should lose her seniority because she did not take oath on that day and her merit must give yield to her uh, seniority which she should lose. Justice Subro Kumo, uh, Kamal Mukherjee was the Chief Justice. I insisted in the full court that it cannot be because the statutory principles have to yield to Article 15.3 and Article 21 more in, importantly. And I raised my voice and Justice Mukherjee, in fact, he was shattered. He said, all right, sister, if you want, I will go to the nursing home and give the oath. I said, if you're doing that, I will accompany you. That was a very good thing. But the lady saved the Chief Justice from going to the nursing home to give oath because on the fifth day after her delivery, she came and took her oath in the Chief Justice chamber and more importantly, she did not lose her seniority. These are the small ways in which judges can help uh, women. And uh, recently I'm told, just last month, a lady who was eight month pregnant, she asked for writing her exam for the judicial recruitment, I think uh, the civil judges exam from her hometown because she couldn't travel after eight months. Again, I am told there was a big controversy whether to permit her or not. 
ultimately thank god they provided a supervisor and she wrote her examination from her hometown that is also a very good positive thing for women the third aspect of my speech is initiator of social reform i need not explain much about vaishakha versus state of rajasthan to this august audience shaira banu's case with regard to triple talaq and also joseph shain another important subject is with regard to the social dialogue and reform which has come up on the question of marital rape justice lokur's judgment in independent thought versus union of india which has read down exception 2 to section 375 of the ipc has raised the age of consent of married girls to 18 and that there can marriage cannot be a basis for discrimination when it comes to consent grant of due value and recognition to household work is another frontier of gender justice where the judiciary has been leading a transformative conversation unfortunately it is only in the case when a homemaker dies and it is in a motor vehicle accident that the determination has to be made as to what is the value of her work for her family which is actually invaluable anyway it some kind of determination is made on the basis of the monetary value the de facto responsibilities of women include mundane and essential household chores including cleaning and laundry a woman has to devote a certain duration of time all days of the week all year round without any break unless she has fallen ill or has other pressing obligations to address at the same time women are also obliged to perform caregiving duties irrespective of their engagement in the public work sphere women also manage important miscellaneous activities such as maintenance of bank accounts planning meals purchasing groceries shopping paying for utilities sending invites for occasions buying gifts for ceremonies getting odd jobs fixed to optimize the family's well-being all on a strict budget so as to save the family's finances these are the aspects which must be taken with regard to the value of a woman's role in as a homemaker not necessarily when it when a, when she dies and the determination is to be made on a monetary basis but on all times to come thanks to the progressive jurisprudence emanating from courts across the institutional hierarchy this unpaid domestic and care work for homemakers has come to be now counted of course as i said only when a homemaker dies widespread perceptions persist that an ideal marriage is one between an educated and well trained man and a woman with a kind of education and background in domestic skills that would make her a good homemaker who is a good homemaker one who does only the cooking the laundry and the cleaning being punctual for others or one who works out and works in both both women and men must realize that they are the pillars of the institution of marriage different pillars serve different but equally important purposes no family can subsist without a healthy balance of econom economics or care work a condescending attitude towards women in the family is the cause of the cracks and domestic violence and infidelity are the outcome of the emerging cracks mr nariman always speaks about the right attitude i would only say that the men must remove that condescending attitude towards women i would like to emphasize that is now i would like to say something about women and marriage because personally speaking i feel that marriage and family as institutions are important in india and that is why we are sustaining as a society i would like to emphasize that it is high time that the institution of marriage and family is protected and sustained in our country and that its very sustenance is dependent upon happiness comfort and well-being of women and everybody in the family must make concrete efforts towards that objective just as the erosion of the proper and just function of an organ of the state 
can have damaging consequences on the entire structure of governance. The erosion of the identity of women in the family, in whatever capacity it is, is bound to cause eventual breakdown of family and marriage. It is often said that behind a successful man is a woman, but I would say that behind a successful woman should be a family. If it is a mother's responsibility to provide necessary psychological and emotional support for a child's learning and education in all realms, it is equally the father's responsibility in that regard. It is also her children, including her male children's obligation to ensure her all-around well-being, especially the senior women in the family. In a lighter vein, I would say, it is said that a son is a son till he gets a wife, but a daughter is a daughter for life. Therefore, it is necessary for sons to look after their mothers when they get old and not uh, ignore them for any other reason. Fr uh, further, a narrow view of marriage between a dominating male person to a subordinated female is, cannot be any longer acknowledged. There cannot be subordination of women in a marriage. It is when, further, it is when men fail to realize that education and financial independence of women make them empowered and they cannot be dominated upon that cracks develop in a marriage leading to abuse, mudslinging and separation. This vitally affects their children who are victims of marital discord. It's high time that the men realize that education and financial independence would mean that they are empowered and therefore the society should know how to treat an empowered woman. I would also like to emphasize that education and financial independence of women cannot result in a woman trying to dominate her husband. I am trying to balance here. Or other male members of her family. Education should result in development of tolerance and resilience within the family and not lead to ego, vanity and looking down upon others. Respect for other members of the family and cultivation of a sense of humility would go a long way in sustaining marriages and families. To be humble is not a sign of weakness. According to me, to be humble is a sign of strength and antithetical to arrogance. The path-breaking work of last year's Nobel laureate in economics, Professor Claudia Golden, speaks pregnantly to the grim labor market outcomes of women in India. For this, intra-household dynamics have a lot to say about whether women work or not. Therefore, all it requires is a greater understanding between the spouses, and one should not always look at it as a sacrifice if a woman sacrifices her career or profession for the sake of the welfare of the family. A woman being a homemaker has to face several challenges, such as being punctual for others, and having no spare time for herself. And if she is not recognized for all her commitments towards the family, I can only feel sad for the men. At the same time, spouses living in different families for the sake of work and meeting during weekends or holidays is gaining acceptance. This is, owning to, this is owing to the women making their presence felt in their workplaces due to their knowledge and skills on the one hand, and the need for additional income for the family on the other. Such adjustments by spouses would go a long way for providing better education for children and having a higher standard of life for the family. Women have come a long way, but we are yet to reach a point where a woman like her male colleagues or her husband, brother or father will be able to enjoy the satisfaction of having a secure, stable work life and a healthy family. Before I conclude, I must emphasize an issue that remains critical to improving the quality of judicial review and adjudication that we, the people, and more importantly, we, the women of India, deserve. There is an urgent need for all organs of the state, institutions engaged in the regulation and growth of the legal profession, and institutions engaged in legal education to work within their mandate to make the Indian judiciary more inclusive and diverse. 
having more women on the bench can contribute to a more effective space for the delivery of justice in India. I will only point to three reasons for this. One the, is the matter of credibility and legitimacy of courts. The second is about the language and vocabularies of judgments. And the third is the administration of courts and the need for different experiences to ensure courts become more gender neutral spaces. Today we have Justice Vishwanathan here amidst us. He's going to be the future Chief Justice of India. And this is my earnest plea to him that to make the judiciary more diverse. The participation of women in the judiciary is not only a constitutional imperative, but also a necessary step to achieve the goal of robust, transparent, inclusive, effective, and credible judicial process. In many ways, that would be the best tribute to the memory of Justice Sunanda Bandari. With this, I apologize if I have taken a little longer time, but I express my gratitude to Sri Murlidhar Bandari and his family and the foundation for giving me this opportunity to share a few of my thoughts on the subject. I thank each one of you for your kind attention. Namaskar. Justice Nagratna, I thank you so much for delivering one of our best lectures till date. May I now request Justice Manmohan to address us. Respected Justice Nagratna, Honorable Judges of the Supreme Court, my sister and brother judges of the High Court, Mr. Falindariman, Mr. Madan Lokur, Mr. Murli Bandare, Ms. Manali Singhal, esteemed members of parliament, lawyers, faculty members, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening. It's always a very difficult act to follow Justice Nagratna. And uh, I have experienced that right from my college days. <laughs> On legacy and influence, uh, Ms. Shannon Alder has famously remarked, and I quote, carve your name on hearts, not tombstones. A legacy is etched into the minds of others and the stories that they share about you. Stories, ladies and gentlemen, are the most significant indicators of a legacy. We are present here today for the 28th time in celebration of the remarkable life that Justice Sunanda Bandare lived. Thank you. We stand here to share the impact of her life and the work that she did and the impact that work had on, on us. We stand here to share our stories about Justice Bandare in Shannon Alder's words, we stand here to acknowledge a legacy which is deeply etched in our hearts. <laughs> Justice Bhandare was a true pioneer in the field of gender equality and women empowerment. She led by example and most significantly, her instrument of change was law. She would not let her vision be cluttered by a haze of prevailing bias and preconceived notions. With robust common sense and brisk pace, she dispensed judgments with a clear focus on solutions. I still remember when I was a fledgling lawyer, I was engaged by a cooperative society that ran a big departmental store in those days called Super Bazaar. In those days, there used to be a lot of pilferage. And one of the CEOs of Super Bazaar came out with a bright idea that if pilferage is beyond 5%, in any department, reductions would be made from the salary of the employees without holding any inquiry. 
So I tried arguing with the CEO that it would be difficult to justify it in a court of law because this would be in violation of principles of natural justice. But he said that it is impossible to hold hundreds of inquiries. So the Super Bazaar decided to make the deductions. As predicted, writ petitions were filed and one of them came to be filed before Justice Bhandari. So, you know, before you entered any courtroom in those days, you would do your own research about the learned judge. And I discovered that she was a prominent labor lawyer who had appeared for a large number of unions. But I was told also that she's very fair-minded and if I was forthright and if she understood that there was a point to be dealt with and if she saw merit in my submission, she would, she would deal evenly with the matter. So when the matter was called out, the petitioner's counsel was not there. And when I started, I honestly confessed to her that we have not held any inquiry. And I told her that we could not hold the inquiry because the magnitude of the problem was immense. And uh, she asked me a few questions about the extent of pilferage, the nature of the pilferage. And when I told her about the magnitude of the problem, she said, it's fine. At that moment, the counsel for the petitioner entered and he argued vehemently on the issue of principles of natural justice. But she said that the problem is so immense that this is the only way it can be tackled. The impression that one got was that she had an open mind and she used to deal with matters with robust common sense. And I think that's a great quality which any judge must have. I was, also, I was also informed that she was the go-to person whenever the brother judges had to organize gifts for their wives. <laughs> Including, I'm told that when Justice Kirpal had a major occasion at his house, uh, an anniversary function, she was the go-to person <coughs> to find out what the gift should be for the wife. And before anyone could realize, she had called the jeweler to the high court and, and something had been purchased. And as Justice Nagratna pointed out, even when she was struck with a very serious illness, she continued to function as a judge. And despite pain and discomfort, she presided over the bench and delivered many memorable judgments. As a daughter, she had close encounters with law and maybe not so pleasant in the initial days when her father, who was a stalwart in his own right, was arrested during the freedom movement. However, despite reasons to be miffed with law, her faith in the power of justice did not shake. In fact, she always stood in the recognition of the ability of the judges to be sentinels of change. It was for this reason that she continued to hold great faith in the instrument of law for achieving equality in all walks of life. As a proponent of equality, Justice Bandare was a pragmatist. Her style of working reflected deep regard for due process and unflinching faith in the constitutional promises of equality and dignity. Today, as we celebrate the life of Justice Bandare, it would be safe to say that she would have rejoiced in the role, of, in the role that the judiciary has played for the empowerment of women. She would also have been delighted to see the increasing representation of women in the profession, especially in the district judiciary. In fact, I was on the committee that interviewed uh, the applicants for the higher judicial service last year, and I'm glad to tell you that majority of the candidates who were selected were women. <laughs> Except for the unfortunate evil that took away Justice Bandare from us at the young age of 52, she would have been present amongst us sharing her ideas for the fulfillment of the constitutional promises. Nevertheless, her ideas and, and her ideals live on. Today, it was a great moment of honor that Justice Nagratna delivered the lecture on the topic of great contemporary importance for gender justice. Her own journey in the profession has been remarkable and she is an inspiration for many men and women in the profession, <laughs> on and off the bench. The role of judiciary in the empowerment of the marginalized, especially of women, is in a state of constant evolution. The topic 
that was chosen by her was well suited to the times we live in, especially when the apex court has transformed the constitutional vision of gender equality into a reality. The landmark decision granting permanent commission to women in the armed forces is a proud illustration. Today we find ourselves in an advanced stage of equality jurisprudence. On this note, I thank the foundation for having me over today. It was a great honor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm reminded here of our former trustee, Justice Leela Seth, who always insisted on a stool to stand on. So uh, I'm roughly, I'm just a bit taller than her. So um, uh, please bear with me. Justice B.V. Nagaratna, Justice Manmohan, Uncle Fali, and Justice Lokur, judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court, senior advocates and lawyers, my colleagues in the media, activists, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope I've not left anybody out. Uh, thank you so much for being here in such large numbers. It says a lot about your respect for my mother-in-law, as well as for our very erudite speaker today, Justice Nagaratna. <laughs> Justice Nagaratna, Indira Jai Singh, in a tribute obituary to Justice Fatima Bivi, who passed away uh, last year, made a very interesting mention uh, in the Indian Express where she, where she wrote this. And she mentioned that Fatima Bivi, Justice Fatima Bivi, had been sworn in by your father. Justice Venkat Ramaya. And it says something about the times we live in and how much we have, how much the gender wheel at least has turned because we're all waiting for 2027. And as many of the speakers have pointed out before me, uh, for our first woman Chief Justice of India. Um, and I thank you for also pointing out uh, your, your very generous tribute to my mother-in-law and for pointing out the importance of having women in positions of power because when my three-year-old niece, Anisha, presents the, the plant to you, she looks at you and says, that could be me. And I think that's really important for all of us. We, we, need, we need role models, women role models like yourself, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 to propel this conversation forward because you know, the first Chief Justice, woman Chief Justice of India will not be the last woman Chief Justice for India and so on. Um, Fali Uncle, still amongst the sharpest minds in the room, uh, always a truth teller, never minces his words. Uh, thank you so much for always being such a generous friend of the family and of the foundation. Uh, Justice Manmohan, your very generous words about my mother-in-law really touched me. And to that, I will add only one thing. Um, when she was ill and she was insisting on going to court in a wheelchair, she had a ramp built in the Delhi High Court and she, she, she didn't miss a day. She wrote that judgment. And I think uh, looking at her as a family member, being a judge gave her a sense of being her own person. She could be herself. She was not ill. She was not a cancer patient. She was not suffering. It was her identity, and it was one that she protected fiercely and left a legacy for us, for all the women in the family, to follow that example, that no matter what it takes, you make your own space. And I really thank her. Uh, every day for, for, for that. So thank you, Justice Manmohan, for your words. Justice Lokur, so generous with this foundation, with your time, with your counsel, with your advice. Um, we miss the trustees who have gone. Um, uh, you know, Mohini Giri Auntie, Justice Leela Seth, and we just Justice Bhagwati. 
We're very grateful uh, to have you to guide us, and we know that we're headed in the right direction. Uh, I'd also like to thank India International Center, our old partners in, in, in this lecture. I'd like to thank Bar and Bench and Live Law, who are our media partners in, trans in transcribing this live. Thank you all for your patience. We've learned a lot. Thank you.